while you're on that and going through all those hundreds of thousands of kilometers to, to get after this, this Over bird. Over 300,000 I did. Well, yeah. there you go. What, what's driving you to do that, psychologically speaking? Total stupidity for one thing. <laughs> Being an idiot, another. Um, and the third? <laughs> punishment. <laughs> I mean, why would any normal human being go out into the desert where it gets up to 50 degrees in the middle of the day, camp on the ground, you know? Well, I think it's, it's a valid question, you know? Like, it's, it's really interesting to, 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 to dig deep into why you're doing that. Look, I, I could say a lot of things, I suppose. And, and um, like I said, I'm a very driven human being. Um, I, don't like, I, don't like, I don't like defeat. Yeah, my, that was a big um, problem with my first wife. She used to say, you'll never find it, you'll never find it. Saying that was like throwing red rag to a bull, saying you'll never drive along the road, because I will. If I want to do it, I'll do it. And the more people say you can't, the more you do, if, if you're driven. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Birding Today podcast, where birders come together to discuss the joy of birding. I'm your host, Thomas Dorig. Today's guest is an Australian naturalist, wildlife videographer and photographer, ecological consultant, wetlands designer and wildlife consultant, with extensive experience in field work, filmmaking and bushcraft. Among many other achievements, he is the designer of the famous Taito Wetlands in Ingham, North Queensland, for the Hinchin Brookshire Council, which has received many awards for conservation, and of course is well known for his rediscovery of the night parrot. He has spent 60 years in the field in most states of Australia, studying the breeding biology of nearly all Australian birds to learn what makes them tick. So please welcome John Young on the show. How are you, John? Thanks for coming. I'm great. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, um, I'd like to thank you for um, inviting me to your home to record this. Uh, I drove down from Cairns um, to record this podcast. And um, let's just jump right in. So the, mm. the, the central aspect of the show is the joy of birding. Yep. What is it about birding that brings you joy? I, I, I think I'm, I'm probably a little bit different on the oddball out. I mean, a lot of people um, like looking at birds and they'll, they'll, you know, they particularly like to keep a list and that sort of stuff and they'll do the, the basic stuff. And mine's more the in-depth in of the breeding biology because I think you can really only manage a bird or its habitat or protect it if you know what, you know, what the breeding biology is, what, you know, the habitat they live in, particular niches they have. Mm -hmm. So the joy of birding for me is to not just to see the bird, but to know what's right behind it, what actually gets to that point. So at the end of the day, the bird comes first, the conservation of the bird comes first. So for me, I need to know about it. I need to know what it ticks, you know, the incubation, where it builds its nest, the whole thing. You can't protect something unless you know where it lives. Mm -hmm. Seeing a bird's nice, but this is the next level. That's the way I see it. And it's the same with photography, right? Um, a lot of birders have a central sort of passion of photography mm, and bird, yeah. and birding surrounds that and they, yeah. and their aim is to get a good photo yeah um and i think it's the same thing you, like for photography and for photographers you need to know about your subject you do yeah. um in the same way that you need to know about your subject for conservation yeah 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 um and so i want to i want to bring it right back to to your to your childhood maybe mm. and um give give our listeners a sense of who you are f from that point onwards. So how did you first get into uh, nature generally and birds specifically? Um, well, my father's been interested in birds, you know, and so was my grandfather right from the day dot. And, you know, I, I was very lucky to have a father who was prepared to take me along and uh, right from when I was three years of age. I think the first nest I sat near was I was 18 months old and dad sat me up in a peach tree next to a Willy Wagtail's nest. That was my introductory piece. Um, but I think being born and raised on a sheep and cattle property and travelling around, you know, shearing and doing all that sort of stuff, um, we had to make our own thing. There was no such thing as computers and all that sort of stuff. So mm -hmm. because Dad was interested in birds and I just loved the bush, it was a way of, you know, it's just a big learning curve. Instead of us going away and visiting our friends, my brother and I, particularly my brother Bruce, and I, we used to just head off into the bush on weekends and just walk around all day and... Rightly or wrongly, I collected eggs uh, for up until 1979. It's known in the film Bird Man of Paradise that I did that, mm -hmm. most of the birds in Australia. Yeah. Um, but that was a learning curve for me. That's what taught me about the bush. Mm -hmm. Not just hearing a bird and seeing it, but knowing where it lived, where it nested, the habitat it needed, and all that sort of stuff. And everything went with that. And 
as time progressed, it didn't just become about birds. It became about butterflies, plants, you know, mammals, frogs, reptiles, every little thing that makes an ecosystem, not just one. And I think if you're going to going to manage an ecosystem or something like that, you really need to have that background. But I was born and raised in the bush pretty well. And where was that exactly in Australia? New England near Armidale in a place called Yarrowich, um, about approximately 55 k east of Walker on the Warhope Road yep. in the mountains, um, where it used to get down to 12 degrees below zero <laughs> in winter time. But I pretty well cut my teeth on, on owls there, sooty owls and powerful owls, and because they breed in the middle of winter, and I don't know how, why they do it, but they do, because, um, and that's where I spent most of my time chasing them. And I learned a lot about owls along the way, and you know, I've done a book with uh, David Holland Birds of the Night. And there's little things when I used to find other nests, which why I say it's all interconnected. Mm. If you wanted to find out whether there was a pair of powerful owls or a pair of sooty owls in the gully, if you went along and looked at all the large bill scrub wren's nest, all the yellow throated scrub wren's nest, they lined their nest with feathers, and sooner or later, the pair of owls inhabiting that gully, one of the feathers would be in the nest, it was just a giveaway. Right. So there's all those little tricks that adds up. It's the interconnectivity of nature. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I used to live, I don't know if you know this, I used to live in Woolgulga, which isn't too far well, from... Well, that's where my mother is at the moment. Woolgulga. You're kidding, really? Yeah. In Woolgulga? Right. Yeah, she is. Oh, that's wow. where my brother lives. Right. My brother, Stephen. Yeah. Small world, isn't it? It, uh, is. it I, is. I lived there um, not long, but um, it's, it's great. I love that eco-region of southeast Queensland and northeast New South yeah. Wales, isn't yeah. it? It's, it's, it's similar up to up here in a way, but it is. Yeah. It's, it's got lots of different aspects of it. And so... Mm. Um, and so that that sort of progressed. And do, do, do you have a specific moment in mind when I ask you what was it that first sparked your interest? Is there like a, a pinpoint moment or was it a gradual interest that was always underlying? I, I think following Dad around, you know, you know, was one thing it became a chore to start with. You know, Dad say, let's go and look at something. I thought, oh, that's nice. Yeah. You know, but, but after a while, it's... I think it's the thing of actually finding your first nest. I just can't remember what the first one was, but I do remember when I was 12, which really drove it home. We had a pair of peregrine falcons, you know, and not far from our place, and it was six kilometres in, or about three and a half miles, whatever the configuration is, um, into this cliff. And, you know, when I still remember the day I climbed down over that cliff was vertical, about 80 feet, and um, in, into this thing, and there was two eggs, and I'll never forget it as long as I live. And ever, after that, you know, I just become obsessed. It was just mm. the more more I saw, the more I wanted to learn, and, and you know, it was every time I saw something, I wanted to I'd find out where it nested. You know, yeah. and and after a while, when you spend enough time with things, you um you get to know whether a bird's coming to the nest, it's going away from the nest. Like for instance, uh, Taloris rifle bird, Victoria rifle bird. Think frequently when she comes to the nest, just before she goes to the nest, she'll pull up on a branch. She'll be looking towards the nest and she'll start pruning and she'll sit there for a little while, flap up a bit and then boom. And you know that happens within about 100 metres of the nest so you can pin things down. Right, yeah. So, and it's, it's that learning curve. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, like I said, it's not just about finding it, what leads up to it. Animal behaviour is, is really interesting, very intricate. And you can't... I always found the first nest that I found of a species was the hardest. After that, the golden rule was I was to sit there and watch that bird for a couple of days, watch its behaviour... Watch what it did around the nest and it'll just lead to the next one. Instead of taking a week to find the next one, it'd take a few hours. Yeah, 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 yeah. You mentioned before um, about egg collecting mm. and you said rightly or wrongly. Yeah. Um, I guess that prompts the question, what, what has changed in the conservation slash naturalist scene? Because back then, what, was it different? Like, because the, one today, one could question the ethics of that, right? Yeah. Um, so how, how has that changed from from back then to, to, now, to, to today, yeah. Well, I think in the old days, the, the done thing was collect skins. I mean, you only go look at the museums, you know. You go in there, the only paradise parrots that are around, they're all shot dead in a, in a drawer. And that makes me just about vomit when I see that. I, I find that incredible. A um, bit different to shooting a pair of birds to compare to collecting. You take a pair of birds, you take generations. Okay, yeah. yeah that That's the big thing. Taking a clutch of eggs... All the birds in Australia, except the one that I know, of, will repeat. Uh, the live bird won't. It'll lay its one egg, and I don't think I've ever seen one go twice, but it'll lay one egg in a year, then, then that's it. Every other bird, like a scarlet robin, it'll, you know, if you take a clutch of eggs, within, within 10 days you've got another nest. They just keep on going. Mm. And frequently the first clutch of the year has often got infertile eggs in it. The second one is nearly all fertile, and that's it. So that's no justification, but I think in the olden days collecting was a done thing. That's how people... That's how science was done, and unfortunately, yeah. in some areas, it still happens a little bit now. 
Yeah. Uh, but it's not my thing. I, um, I've been there and done that until 1979. I found all the Australian birds nesting except for six. Mm. Um, that's, you know, up until recently. Um, uh, and I, I collected a lot until the 79, but Night Parrot was, was number six, now there's five. And one that I would dearly love to see, but I doubt whether it still exists, is the Paradise Parrot. I've looked in so many places and I've found some in very encouraging holes in mounds and that made me just, you know, shudder. Mm. Is it real or is it not? But, um, yeah. I think it can be easy to be too optimistic. Do you, do you find that? Um, I, th I think if you're pessimistic, you're not going to go anywhere. If you're in business, if you're positive, you're going to win. And for me, the golden rule is, even when I did martial arts, when I did Wing Chun, the golden rule was, my, my sensor used to say to me, you say, if it gets tough, that's when the tough gets going. And I did it with the night parrot. Mm. Now, if, if I'd have been pessimistic chasing the night parrot, I would never have found it, not in a million years. I'd have given up. A lot of people thought, oh, well, let's pack up and go looking for a night parrot. They do it for four days and it's heat and a million flies. But Jesus, what am I doing out here? I did it for eight years. And eight years, not a sound, nothing. And there's a photograph of me standing near my old blue Toyota in the middle of nowhere. And, and I was the depth of despair. And I'd go home and think, well, you know, don't be, don't be a lazy bugger. Don't whinge about it. No one's going to find it if you sit on your backside and do something. I know it's there. Let's do it. And that's the way I made it. I don't like second best. Right. Well, let's let's dive into the uh, night parrot at this at this stage. Um, although I was going to keep it for later, but you, you you brought it up, so I think and it's what interests a lot of listeners. Um, so I'm interested. Why don't we trace the whole journey of the night parrot mm. way back when? So be before human settlement, even before indigenous people. Mm. So when Australia was free of humans. Yeah. S yeah. Let's just start there. So um, the, the the night parrot once was common we know that but do we know it's, it's a question i've just thought about but do we know anything about it before human settlement i don't, I don't think so I, I think it's hypothetical if, if we do that i mean if we knew anything about night the night parrot before human settlement it would have made my job easier i mean there'd have been some information but there wasn't there was fleeting fleeting glimpses of it you know someone saw a night parrot and you know and i thought well did they or didn't they you know, right there was one in wa and i, I still question that one um, where someone thought they saw three of them come into a water hole long before dark. Well, I know for a fact they don't come in, and, and probably one one person knows more about night parrots than anybody is Nick Lissenberg, who who did his PhD on my original discovery site, and um, I'm sure he would he would tell you the same thing that um, um, I, I very much doubt whether a lot of the sightings are real. You can see a lot of things if you really want to see them. Well, that's what I meant before with my optimistic yeah, I, I, mindset, you know, like... That, that's, a diff that's a different type of optimistic, though. That, that's the one you want to see something so bad that you see it. My optimism is about, let's go and look for it until we find it. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't care, and the harder it becomes, the harder you try. It, it, it's what you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I had Nick on the show uh, a couple of episodes ago, and it was a well, very... I respect Nick. It was a very yeah. productive discussion, and it was really interesting uh, f f to, to, to know all about the, the night power at work that they do. And, and, and so going back to the, to, to, to the bird itself, um, of course, at a given point in history, um, the, the indigenous Australians arrived, mm. uh, and then so they changed the landscape a bit with, with, in terms of the fire management. I think we have to pull up the fire management because um, I think a lot of people, when I'm going to step on toes or not, but I'm going to be as blunt as I'm going to be, um, I think we keep using the fire management as, as a tool which Indigenous people used, and, and to some degree they did. But I think we need to bear in mind they had to live. They ha had to hunt food. And if you burn a complete landscape um, from where I sit, you wipe the whole habitat out, you wipe everything out. Fire in spinifex. Spinifex explodes. It just explodes, and anything in it is gone. Anything that flies out in front of it, the black kites, the falcons, everything, take them. They've got no way of getting out. So I think that's probably been the biggest thing. But I, I look at what, what the Indigenous people are, and I have a lot of friends and a lot of respect for our Native people, more so than I do for a lot of white people because I, I, I know what they've been through. And um, a lot of it was built for food. You burn a patch, you know the animal's going to come to it, you know you've got a chance of collecting food. You're not just burning the whole landscape. Mm -hmm. we, we use the term, let's fire manage these days, and you know we burn the whole bloody lot and we wipe things out. I mean... It's crazy, crazy what we use in the name of the match. It just should not be happening. Mm. Well, that's what I mean with the with, with the fire aspect of it, and also, of course, the the introduction of uh, you know alien mammals mm. like cats, 
Um, well, they're the biggest ruin, the biggest menace. I think cats are one of the worst predators. There's, I mean, you, you think about it. They're, they're, it's instinctive hunters. It's not the cat's fault. Um, it, it's our fault. We brought them here. Yeah. Um, but we, that's beside the point. Mm. It's like Indian miners. They turned up here with us, but we can't let them go because they push out the native species. Cats kill millions of animals every night. And anyone has got a pet cat and said, oh, my cat doesn't kill anything, go and read a book. Get real. Of course they kill it. They're instinctive. That's what they do. That's how they survive. So as far as I'm concerned, if there was a virus and I knew it wasn't going to get into our, our other feline, which is a big problem, I'd release the bloody thing myself because the amount of animals, and particularly with night parrots, you know, they're, they're just totally prone. You know, and the young ones, as, as Nick, of all people, knows, they make themselves really obvious when they're, yeah. when they're making a noise because I've seen that myself in, in this just this recent year, mm. how obvious they are. And the calling goes on and on and on and any cat that's right mind is after food is going to take them. Well, like you said, it's mm. it's just it's not the it's not strictly speaking the animals' fault no, because it's that's not, just not it's, the that, that's how it's evolved. It's we humans. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for listening to the Birding Today podcast. It's great to have you with us. If you're enjoying the show, don't hesitate to leave a positive review on whichever podcast app you're using at the moment. This really helps with getting the podcast up in search results and reaching more people. Thank you, and back to the show. Jumping from that to your more active search. Yeah. So you spent, talk us through, um, uh, uh, you know, a lot a lot of uh, attention goes to the rediscovery itself, but what I'm maybe more interested in, or, or at least as interested in, is the, the lead up to that and the years of searching. Mm. So... Talk us through that, like the, the inhos- inhospitable places that you went to and the lengths that you went to to find this bird again. Well, I, um, you know, I, I talked about 15 years to, to do it, which is I actively became very serious for those 15 years, more so in after um, September uh, 2009, I think it was, when Shorty Cupid found the bird in the fence, which I'll come to later. But I'd worked with most of the birds in Australia, up until 1989, then I had a casual interest in the night parrot, and I started. I really did start looking for the bird in 1989, which is way back. But I, I probably would have spent a month, a year, I suppose, on it and and doing it. And then um, the more I started to reel about it, and the harder it became, you know, I, the harder I thought, you know, it's got to be out there. No way known can this country be so big with that much spinnerbacks and all us white people that think we are so smart, scientists and naturalists alike. You know, think we are so smart that we can cover every inch of the area. We don't know anything about this thing, what it calls like, you know, what what it sounds like, anything. So, um, I started to do it on a on a um, systematic approach. Okay. First thing you need to think about, you know, a parrot that feeds on seeds. Well, we know they don't all just feed on seeds. They feed on a lot of other things. And again, the Nick's credit, he knows more about that than anybody I I could possibly do. Um, but most things that feed on seed, I've got to drink water. You know, grain and things like that, you know, creates, mo- you need moisture, you need moisture to compensate it. So the first thing I think about, you know, um, why, not we, why don't we sit around water holes? And then, you know, I did that for five years. I slept around troughs. And the thing was, you know, rightly or wrongly, I used to go to the most remote places possible because I thought, maybe they're out here because no one's been here. I used to leave the road. There's one place on the edge of um, the Simpson Desert where I did 450 kilometres through the dunes by myself with a Toyota, no tracks, no nothing, for 21 days. And I found water holes and troughs, and I used to always put one microphone near the water hole, near the trough, cattle trough, and one out in the field so I could pick up sounds. And in all that tens of thousands of hours of stuff, I not once heard a call that, that I thought um, that could be a parrot. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt. I, 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 while you're on that, and going through all those hundreds of thousands of kilometres... To, to get after this, this Over bird. Over 300,000 I did. Well, yeah. there you go. What What's driving you to do that, psychologically speaking? Total stupidity for one thing. <laughs> Being an idiot, another. Um, and the third? <laughs> punishment. <laughs> I mean, why would any normal human being go out into the desert where it gets up to 50 degrees in the middle of the day, camp on the ground, you know, well, I think it's it's a valid question, you know. Like it's it's really interesting to 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 dig deep into why you're, you're doing that. Look, I I, I could say a lot of things, I suppose, and and um, like I said, I'm, I'm a very driven human being. Um, I don't like I don't like I don't like defeat. Yeah, my, that was a big 
um, problem with my first wife. She used to say, you'll never find it, you'll never find it. Saying that was like throwing red rag to a bull saying, you'll never drive along the road because I will. If I want to do it, I'll do it. And the more people say you can't, the more you do, if, if you're driven. But um, I, I suppose the more I looked, the more effort I put in, the more time I put in, I invested so much time in it, I thought, how can I throw all those years away and give up when it could be just around the corner? Someone said to me along the way, you know, closer towards the last couple of years, he said, you could be so far, yet you could be so close. Mm. And you know, those sort of things kept me going. And, and I used to, some nights I'd be camped, because I always used to, to um, camp in remote places. And, and it was always in the back of my mind because of the birds collecting in Spinifex. Now, back in the 1800s, um, that, the bird would be in Spinifex somewhere. But there was one collected inside a cave, I think, and I'm pretty sure it was in a cave, the one that went to England. Now, Nick will know more about that than me. But then after I couldn't get them at water holes, I thought, well, they're not coming to water. And the thing was, the drier it became, was, how are these birds living out here when there's no water? Now, all the other birds are gone. What's keeping me? And I found out later, these birds were there right through and there was no water at all. They, they were still living there, which means they were getting moisture from something. Nothing can live without moisture. So I thought, let's not worry about the troughs. If they were around troughs, someone would have already done it. And we knew at the time there was hundreds of thousands of people, you know, highly skilled people. Harry Butler even went out there and made a great story, you know, it rained on the night, I put the nets up here, yeah, right, okay. Um, he just couldn't get them, unfortunately. He tried, but he just didn't get them. So the next step was, after the water thing failed, um, I'll come back to that later, because one night I did have a pair come to water. And was understand in the water. Well, we know, like I, I, um, Nick told me this on the episode I did with him, is that um, we know that they're quite mobile. They are, and they visit different sites for different reasons. Yeah, they do, and that makes them hard to track, right? Yeah, and so you've got to be at the right place at the right time. Well, you do. Well, I was camped near a waterhole once in the Diamantina, which I had seven sites there, where three of my um, uh, where I had nest sites, and then there was four other sites where I'd heard birds calling. They were sceptical about that, but after there was some work done. My, my work was verified. It didn't go public, but I made it public, so all the world could see. Um, but I was camped near a waterhole one night, a very remote one, and it was 2.16, two 2.17 two two in the morning, and I was just laying there in the moonlight, and all of a sudden I heard just singing, because bird parrots, they'll come in in the twilight, they'll come in an hour before daylight. You know, they don't move around during the day much. Obviously, that's because of a predator thing or something. I'm only guessing, but... But anyway, this thing, I heard this call in, and it was in, in the water, I could hear it, and I thought, you know, of a night time in the desert, you drop a pin, you can hear it 20 metres away, it's so, everything's amplified. This thing was doing, they're doing these funny little calls, I thought, shit, is that a bird parrot? So is this the night of the rediscovery? No, way, way after. Oh. W- way after. See, and I didn't know this, I mean, and, and going back looking at the stuff now, because when, when I heard this noise, I know I'll backtrack a bit, but when I heard this noise, I, I slowly did undid the zipper, the, the tent, and... Normally zips you can't hear them, but at night time when things are quiet, like, one little zip of the thing, it sounds like a bloody D9 coming towards you, it's so loud. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I got outside and I put the head torch on and I slowly lift up and here's a male night parrot sitting in the water and the female's on the bank and they, boom, they just took off, that was it. That is the only time I've ever seen them in the, seen them at water, ever. And I went around, I, I think I stayed at boar, boars in the desert, you know, probably one new one every night to do it in the hottest, the driest, the wettest, I tried every month. Not once did it, did it happen. Not once did a call come up that even sounded like a parrot. Because mm. I'm smart enough to know what, what it sounded like. But anyway, the next thing come that this thing had been found in a cave. And I thought, well, maybe they're in caves. Maybe they're in caves. Maybe that's why no one... Look, they're all looking for water. They're all spotlighting, you know, doing all this sort of stuff. And, and um, I thought, there's no point in looking along the roads in that way because people would have already seen them. They'd have had spotlights. They'd been looking. They would have seen it. Mm-hmm. Knowing back now, someone that I know really well did see one in the spotlight and wasn't game enough to tell anybody. And I know him well enough to know he was right. And so let's <laughs> let's look back to the um, to the night of the rediscovery because it's a big deal, right? So um, talk talk me through and talk talk us through um, the that night. Well, the fact of the matter was, you know, Nick's right about the movement to start with. I had my first time I heard the bird was in in July, July uh, two twelve. That was when the bird was listed the most mythical bird in the world. It was just so unknown. And I heard the bird, I knew what it was. You know, this ding, ding, and I thought, you know, nothing calls like that. And I had three people there with me, and a bloody um, uh, bomber pilot from England, and Corey Mead, who's probably one of the best 
naturalist that, that I know. He's just a great guy to work with. We're all there. Anyway, it, we went on and we spent two weeks on that, sitting near it and listening to it. And I actually went down in the gully one day and, and I don't know, it's, call it what you will. I walked into the gully and I said, I shouldn't be in here. This is not a place for me to be. This bird's went unnoticed for so long. This is not my place to intrude. So I never went in there. I watched, listened to that place on and off for 12 months. And for the last six months, the bird totally went, gone, not a sound. It comes back to what Nick said. You know, you can't just go and be guaranteed you've got them in one spot because I know they alternate, they, they move a bit. But I was just about to give away and my wife at the time said, don't you come home until you find one and I thought, oh yeah, good. Because I had John Stewart with me, who was with me for the last bit of the search. Um, there's a picture of him there standing in the sandfire with a red jumper on. Any, anyway, um, he said, come on, mate. He said, give it another go. You just never know. And I thought, oh, yeah, right. So let's move over to this other place I've seen. It looks similar, 800 metres away. We got on top of the hill. I said, you sit one side and I'll sit the other. And it was windy, just on dusk, about 25 to 7. Ding, ding. And I thought, holy shit. Is, is there not, there's a pair here, you know, whether they've moved or it's another pair or not. And I now know it was, a, you know, it was another pair. And um, that was the second, second pair that I got onto. So... Two nights in a row, going back to my collecting days, I decided to watch the bird and listen to it and see its movement, where it was going, what it was doing. Was it pairing up with the female? Was he, was he going in a particular thing? And I found out, just listening to his calls, he had this one track he used to go over night time. They seemed to go about 100 metres, what seemingly was on the ground. Then it was just gone and I'd hear a ding, ding way off, which means I think he just flew off or it was another one. I don't know. So I said to John this next night, I said, let's try it. Let's put the chairs up. You've got an image there with the two of us sitting in a chair, sitting in this little clearing. I said, let's sit in a clearing. And there was a tussock, big bit of spinifex right near it. Sure enough, right on dusk, ding, ding, only about 50 metres away from us. And he kept coming and a little bit of ding and I could hear this, this funny little buzzing sound they do coming towards it, which means, indicated to me that maybe the, the female was with him, I don't know, or one of the pair. And it come so close and was just about to go and the call I recorded in, in April of, April of, um, oh, when was it? April 2009. April 2009, I think. God, I'm not exactly sure of the dates. But anyway, when I got my first call, <coughs> I played it and he went quiet. Nothing. Then I played it again and I said, just there's one tussock. He said, not going to come around the side. He'll come out the front. But we're watching the tussock and he didn't. He came out through the middle of the tussock. He dropped on the ground. He was flopped up. He was so angry. And, I had the Nikon D800 in the flash and I turned everything on and slowly tipped the camera up, so we are in, fired it and I looked at it and there was nothing in it, just a blade of grass. So, you know, my heart just went through the floor and he was gone. Right. And I, I thought, that's it. But I played it once more, then just over to what passed John, I, I saw him cross and he was going across the thing and I turned the camera and went bang, bang, bang and I got a head, I got a tail and I got the full bird and that was the first images that I got of him. And I looked up and thought, God, I said, turn the torch on. So we had the torch on and held him in a spotlight for about 35 minutes, something like that. And I took over 600 images, laying on the ground, every angle I could possibly think of, you know, and, and they were the first pictures. But John and I, walking back to the car that night, we had tears running down our face and just... That's what I want to touch on oh. now. Is the, is, it goes back to the joy of burning. What, what, was, it, what was going on? In your, in your mind or in your heart or wh whatever it is, in your spirit, it, that, that made you so emotional? It was, like, it was like looking at a ghost, something that wasn't real. You know, I'd been looking for this thing for, since 1989, respectively, 15 years, solidly. And I, I, I think, you know, the most amazing thing that, like John thought at the time, he, he just felt really privileged that he was part of it because he came with me for the last five years. I actually said, you want to go look for the night parrot? And, he said, do I ever? Anyway, when it, when it happened that night, I, I just thought it was an out-of-body experience. I found some things in my time and nothing broke my mentality or the heartstrings or made me feel wobbly all over. And the tears streamed down my face. I'm not a very emotional person. But the mere fact that that bird showed herself that's been hidden for 100 years, 100 years um, to itself when tens of thousands of people, some of them, Incredible scientists and some of the best naturalists in the country have been looking for. I never found it, and I achieved it. You now through the dogged perseverance, perseverance. Um, I, I, I can't. I just can't. I don't, no words will describe it. It was. It was just. You know, I, I was in a mess for. It's the first time in my life I'd never slept for three days till I got home. You know, it was. 
I walked walk back to the car and I sat there. We grabbed a glass of wine and just stoked the fire up and we're just sitting there. We never said anything to anyone. Either of us never said anything. And I got to one in the morning and John's still awake. I couldn't sleep. I said, let's get out of here. I don't want anyone to know where this is. This is a gold mine. It'll take the roof off the world when this comes out. And um, we drove home and we were just, you know, the worst part about it on the way out, I was so excited, not watching for holes, and I drove the Toyota into a great big hole and dropped the front of the vehicle into a hole. And I got out and John said, how are we going to get out? And I said, we won't get out if we don't get our butts out and dig it out. So I filled the thing up and jacked it out and we got off. But I drove from the Diamantina or um, Brighton Downs all the way home to Townsville without any sleep. You know, it was just, holy shit, holy shit. Isn't it strange that a bird can do that? A lot of things can do it, I think, you know. It, you know, it's, um, it all depends on what your passion are. I'm incredibly passionate about what I do, you know. I, I'm, I'm not just about seeing something. There's a lot more to it than that. And, and, yeah, well, um, that, that's another theme of the, of the podcast is all the, all the themes and topics around birding. Um, and, you know, birders are very different people. You yeah. know, one birder can be very different to another birder. Yeah. Um, and so we have di- different ways of expressing that. For example, mm-hmm. you could look at, uh, you know, listing. What do you think about, like, uh, do, do, you, do you do lists when no. you, you don't do lists? Why, why don't you? I, I don't see the need. Um, look, I, I congratulate everybody if they've got a list and they want to do it. I mean, a lot, a lot of people, if something turns up, like, for instance, the Isabella Weedia turned up near Mount Malloy many years ago. I was there with a tour group and everyone to go and said, oh, look, it doesn't breed in Australia. I don't need to see it. That's fine. I, I wasn't interested. Not at all. Hmm. I, I have no interest in doing a list whatsoever. I mean, I, I keep records of the breeding biology. And I, I, I know from my own personal experience of where things are. But, I mean, every one of us are different. I, I want to learn about it. I don't want to see it for five minutes. Some people will see things for 30 seconds. And when I was a tour guide and had my own tour company, I had people where I'd spend weeks lining something up. Someone would come in and say, yep, that's it, tick. And I thought, why did I spend those two and a half weeks? What's the matter of that? But obviously they got as much joy out of that as what I did out of, out of finding the nest. And the thing is... Birding is big business now. It's tourism. Yeah. It's dollars in banks. It's, it's, it's accommodation. It's binoculars, vehicles, fuel, you know, everything. You know, mm. the best place in, in Australia is Iron Range. It's one of the, the meccas of the place that I've been going to for six, about 65 visits here now mm. since, since 1976. Yeah. And I still love the place. And you, desc- and you describe yourself as a naturalist. Yes. First and foremost, and a birder second, would you say? Um, no, I wouldn't describe myself as a birder at all. Wow. That, that, that's the odd thing. Um, I love birds. I love birds. I'm not a birder. Um, I, I see myself as a naturalist. I, I prefer to live by that. So you could say that a non-birder rediscovered the night parrot? Yes. <laughs> look, look, I'm, I'm not being disrespectful in the slightest. No. I, I, it, it, it's my, my personal thing. A birder to me is someone that goes looking for birds, gets great joy out of it, and I say, good on them. You know, I get just as equal enjoyment out, maybe even more. I, I like to eat, drink and sleep the animal, to know at what it ticks, every little move it makes, every little motion it makes, you know, what it feeds on, where it builds its nest. Why do we need to protect a hollow tree because if for a barn owl? Because if we haven't, don't protect a hollow tree for the barn owl, they don't have a place to nest, the population doesn't expand. Mm-hmm. And, and I've learned enough about birds over the years now to drive along the road, knowing what I've done now in all seven states, and to look that side of the hill and say, okay, if you're out around, you know, for Apleton since there'll be horse babbler there because there, there's, you know, there's um, mulga trees there and if there's dense undergrowth, there'll be splendid wrens there. And if there's spinifex outside with a few perches, there'll be, you know, rusty grass rings. And I know I, know I can do that now. And I know when I go in there, they're going to be there, mm. you know, unless the numbers are down. But without, if you're just a birder, I, I think you learn a lot and you know some of the habitat about it, but you don't, go inside to another world like going inside and living how the bird is Mm -hmm. I I, I like to almost you know I'm not saying I think like a bird no one does a lot of people say they can but that's rubbish we can anticipate what a bird does and that's been my skill over the years is to do that and you know I um, rightly or wrongly I I don't give locations out now because it's you know there's the recently in Victoria um, someone had a peregrine falcon and it's quite an active one at the the site was giving out to a particular organisation. I'm not going to put any organisation down because that's not my thing. But thousands of people went there and it deserted. It was only there for a week and they took off. And I don't ever want to see that. I don't ever want to be responsible 
for finding something really rare and giving the sight away unless there's a limited number of people going to do it. Now, I know a lot of birders are out there going to hate me for that, and that's okay. You're allowed to think that way. But I'm not just thinking about the pleasure of seeing something. I'm thinking about the conservation of it because we are, rightly or wrong, we're the biggest virus this world has ever seen. We have the power to wipe out forest overnight. Look at the Amazon. When that's wiped out, the, the road is we're growing crops and we've got to do to survive. And you can't get stuck into people when they want to clear a bit of land to feed their families. That's wrong. Mm. It's a population and the expansion of the population. And that comes back to birding. If four or five people go and see it and they're careful about it and respectful of it, then others can. But if two or three go and see it and do the wrong thing, there's some people when they're taking photographs, the almighty photograph comes first, not the bird. And if I have to I know for a fact 40, uh, uh, Fawn Breasted Bowbird in Cape York, they took all the branches out of the front of the bow just to get a clear shot. Now that's not birding, that's vandalism. And if you've got to do that to take a photograph, you shouldn't be out there looking at our birds, you should not be doing it. I agree, um, although knowing, I guess the peregrine falcon isn't really considered rare. It's beside the point, everything's special as far as I'm concerned. Or, I, I agree to an extent, but uh, if you're talking about a very rare bird, surely knowing, or um, I don't want to use the word publishing its location, but revealing it to the relevant parties that could help yeah, in its conservation, absolutely. that could be, that's useful, right? If, if, if it stays there, but unfortunately a lot of the time it doesn't. You know, there's always, you, you can have, I remember when I had tours for years ago, you'd always have 16 people, 18 people, and it'd always be one that'd make it really difficult for everybody else. You couldn't tell them, you know, I had a sooty owl's nest and everybody was happy to stay back, you know, 100 metres away or whatever and just let it do its thing and let it come and go. But one person, no, I want to be first. I want to be right up under the tree and take the photo. Flashing away. Flash is for one thing, you know, pretty powerful on a bird that's not used a big burst of light. It's like a strike of lightning. Mm. Um, so, yes, I, I agree. We can't look after something unless we've got the right people doing it. What Nick Leesonsberg's done, few people can do in the world. He's just worked with one of... Thanks to my efforts, I'll say, I have to say, there's others trying to claim the credit, but they didn't find it, I did. Um, Nick's got enough information out there now to know how to manage stuff. And without Nick going in there and doing that stuff, we can't look after things in the future. And, and there should be more people like Nick that care about things and does the right thing. Um, but not everybody does. Right. That's the unfortunate part. Right. And I think um, it, it, it's all to do with the place. Like I, I mentioned to you before um, that the, you know, for, for me, the charm of the bird yeah. is somehow ensconced in the place itself. Yeah. Do you get joy from being out there in the place of oh, the bird? Absolutely. Yeah, right. Let's talk about that. What, what brings you joy about, uh, about the place? The, you know, the, these vast remote places that don't even have any roads. Yeah. What, what is it about being out there? that is so attractive to you? I think the remoteness to start with. I don't like people. I know I'm not a people person. I don't particularly like journalism much. You know, a lot of times people don't let any rubbish get in the road of a good story. That's just life. You know, we only got to watch, watch what happens somewhere with the modern war and all that sort of stuff at the moment, you know. Unfortunately, things being disclosed, people get killed before that. You know, someone is saying, you know. But getting off the beaten track, I'm really happy. When I did that trip into the Simpson Desert, I... Um, went way west looking for the parrot in the early days and I did 450 kilometres through the sand dunes in my Toyota and almost run out of food at the end. Well, I did. And you were on your own? Oh, on my own. I like myself. I, when I say I like myself, I definitely don't. None of your business, okay? <laughs> I can edit that out. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's right. No, leave it there. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is it's, it's a remoteness. Yep. Laying there at night time, animals become my friends, birds become my friends. I don't feel lonely. I think what you meant before with your comment is that you like your own company. I do. Yeah. yeah. I'm the same. I, I quite enjoy, because there's no outward pressure, I suppose. There is. And, 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 and then also it goes back to, to a common theme of the, of the show, which is um, going back to the birding as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Birding as a group yeah. and birding solo. Hmm. And you could expand that to other parts of the of the natural world, say, you know, butterflies or, or going well, herping. Butterflies are one of my big things. Yeah. Well, we could talk about that later as well. Um, but um, so what do you think? Because there are advantages to going out into nature with a group because you, you bond over... You over and it's uh, excitement, sharing yeah, excitement. That's right. But you think that's not as powerful as being out there alone? 
I, I think it's it's a group of people. A lot of people find that very powerful. Some people find it really difficult. I mean, I, on tour once I had, you know, I, I don't find being in the middle of the Simpson Desert with no trees for 100 kilometres in every direction daunting. I think it's beautiful. I agree. The stars are night time. You can see a million stars and, you know, you can hear a pin drop. But I had one lady got out of the car on, on a tour. She got outside and she... Not claustrophobia, I don't know what she felt, but she started to cry because she was so isolated and suddenly realised she was in such a remote place, you know. Yeah, well, that's the opposite of claustrophobia. I, the word escapes I, me I now. Think of it, it's, yeah. it's, there is a term for it. Yeah. Uh, it starts with A, I think. Hmm. But... But it's that it's 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 like the fear of the of the of the vastness. The unknown. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and well, the unknown is what I like. Right. That's the draw card for me. Yeah. There's nothing better than me driving along a road. Oh, that's nice. I, I mean, I, I I have my eyes in the field ninety percent of the time and ten percent on the other time on the road. All you police are not to watch on the road. <laughs> no policemen are watching. Yeah, that, that's okay. They yes, they will. <laughs> yeah. Um, but. Yeah. yeah, and and I think it all, it all comes back to that to that joy of birding, and um, and I do want to touch on um, you've had a career as as a filmmaker, yeah, and a wildlife photographer. So when I was a bit younger, um, I wanted to become a wildlife cameraman, mm. and you were one. Yeah. How did that happen, and what was what was the joy of of doing that, and were there challenges to it as well? Challenges, I, I think, because I'm a stubborn individual i like to learn from my own mistakes when you do it and and sometimes you know filming is very it's quite a technical aspect some of my best friends are mike mike pot who did killer whales wolves of the sea you know he i learned from him but one of my biggest mentors was jim frazier and denzi klein she used to write you know uh, small books for animals they were my business partners pretty well for 10 years jim was you know he was inventive he did all sorts of stuff and i watched from him and i learned from him that's what I did, and I took it to another step. The difference was that why we got involved, because I was into butterflies. I got into um, amassing a massive collection of butterflies and you know, learning about their biology and all sorts of things from 1981. Because being an egg collector in 1979, I gave all that away, and I needed... I've, I've, got to be, I've got to have something to collect and look at and to learn from, and you can't really look at something and learn about it until you've actually got the, the individual to look at. Yeah, yeah. So filming with Jim, you know... When he did the film to be a butterfly, I was finding all the larvae. I found the, the um, um, a lot of the the Lyphira brisolis, the moth butterfly. It's a myrmecophage, a caterpillar that actually eat green treants. And I, I raised them, and you know, I did a lot. And we did that. It's in volume two of Australian Geographic. Is and is there some overlap in with, with that? Because like, I'm, I'm getting, I, I quite enjoy butterflies. I've recently bought the, you know, the field guide and just getting into it. And whenever I see one in the field, uh, I t- try and yeah. t- take a picture of it. Yeah. I, I've always wondered this, um, though, about butterflies. The, the, about the, I was in in this same guide, the field guide to butterflies. You know, the mm. one you must do. Um, it says at the beginning about like killing jars and stuff. That, yeah. I, that that doesn't sit right with me for some reason. And I know they're insects, but. Something about it makes me uncomfortable. Hmm. Does that is that fair to say? Well, I I, I think you know I, I obviously obviously do that. I, I pinch yeah. them that, in the net. That's what I do. I pinch them. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure that I like the idea of something being put in a jar and suffocated to death. I, I think that's not right, to be honest. And I, I did it to start with when I, when I started collecting, and I just couldn't watch it. I just couldn't do it. And um, instant in the net. I, I'll, I'll be honest. You know, I've got a large collection, and you do. You, collect butterflies you're going to do it but the other thing the animal's got a very short lifespan and if you raise because in a while if a butterfly lays 100 eggs say and probably only two or three of those are going to get through there's going to be parasites there's going to be something eats the caterpillars there's going to be you know all sorts of things that'll happen but if you raise them which i try to do i I tend to keep keep a small number and i raised red lace wings here last year synthosia um on ardenia heterophila and i've got the big plant in the yard I, I got a batch of eggs, raised three or four hundred. I kept a dozen out of them and I let the others go. Mm-hmm. I probably released two hundred. So, if it's any justification, I, I, I can say, whilst I keep some, I most definitely do, and I will continue to do so. Non-protected species, mm-hmm. but um, I also release it because I get a kick out of kick out of doing that and seeing them go. And instead of one or two getting away, it might be fifty get away. That's no justification. But that's 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 what I do. Yeah. But but you also learn about butterflies is one thing, but watching them lay eggs, following a butterfly around for days and days and days, or whatever you might do. Some of them are really hard. And yeah. a Pacharina or a Minio or the Turco is emperor. 
Every man his dog's trying to find out on Cape York Peninsula. I'm one of the six six people in the world that's got one, and an original specimen I caught a few years ago. And um, the, even the female's not known. But one day I'm going to watch a female and watch her go and lay an egg on the plant and take it through with the biology and know that plant's going to be protected. Mm. See, because butterflies are really interesting too because even a lot of my um, um, ecology stuff done over the time, it's not just about birds. You learn about them... But, Often when you've got a sharp hilltop, a lot of male butterflies, hilltop, they use hilltops. They go up there and they wait for the females to come up. Now, certain species, once you know they come up, if you know the host plant, you know the host plant's not far away, so you know you need to protect that piece of plant. So just being on a hilltop, it becomes a conservation value. So whether you're rightly or wrongly, I keep them, but I also learn about them. I did it with the egg collection and I'll do it with the butterflies. And there's a lot more I don't know. I don't amass masses. I keep enough for interest's sake. I'm very meticulous about why, why I keep them, but it also helps me manage habitat and biodiversity because it's not just about a birder, it's not just about a butterfly man, it's not just about reptiles, frogs, everything's in, interconnected. We pull one, one thing out, something else falls over. Right. So we've got to make sure we keep the lot. And with that knowledge and drive that you have, I want to look, bring it back to the filmmaking. I know, I know that you were involved in um, David Amber's Life of Birds, is that yeah. right? That's that's well, that's kind of special for me. Like I, I, I grew up with that, and it was, you know, it blew my mind as a as a child. So what was your what was your role? I, 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 I actually, believe it actually was filmed the life history of the um, the golden headed sister cull that actually pulls the leaf together and sews yeah. sews the leaf together. Yeah. That was my segment in there. So, really? Wow. So the interesting thing with that again, it's not just about seeing the bird; it's what makes it tick. Yeah. When I was watching these things build, I saw it screwing its bill into the leaf and sewing the grass together. What's it doing? Then it was sowing, I thought, how's it getting that? And I watched it go away, and there's this little crab spider, got a very strong web. It was flying over there, getting the web, coming back, pulling the t- hooking the web up on a, on a bit of grass, pulling the leaves together, getting this bill, drilling a bill really hard, grabbing the web, sowing it, and hanging it back up, and hopping inside, and that's how it sewed the leaf together. Now, what happens, spider's web, like butterflies. If a butterfly cuts a little thing out like a netricorn and a panda, the eastern flat, Silk shrinks. So when it cuts a hole in the leaf, the leaf bulbs over, and because it shrinks on the outside, it pulls a little dish, so the caterpillar gets up inside and it doesn't get wet. It becomes like a thing. So anything that's sewed up by silk, like the sunbird building the nest just out there right now, the silk wound around becomes tight mm. when it dries, mm. and it becomes strong. So, you know, there's all these little things you learn. Yes. And, and even with parasitism, cookies are my biggest thing. And I've done more with parasitism in Australia than probably anybody. Well, I, I, I quite like video as well, as my listeners know. I, I'm, I'm big into video because it communicates so much. Live, yeah. That's right. And I think it communicates more than photography in a way um, because you have obviously a more... Well, uh, you can also see emotions. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Birds have emotions like we do. You know, e- even the way when you're filming something, you can tell whether a bird's stressed or not. I see some fantastic grass in pictures. Unbelievable. But they're all hop out and they've got their feathers stuck in the air. No way known they didn't, haven't had playback done to them for half an hour to get them to that point. Well, this is something that you wanted to touch on, um, John, is, yeah. is, is playback. So what, what, what are your thoughts on playback? And there is some utility in it, I, I, I think. Oh, absolutely. In, in, in specific ways. But what are your general thoughts on, on that? Look, playback, one of my best friends is Rod Kavner. You know, I helped him do his PhD on owls of Australia. Uh, you know... We managed a lot of habitat, and thanks to him and his, his efforts and my participation, a huge amount of area has been protected for owls and powerful owls, sooty owls, mask owls, you know, the large forest owls you know, around Eden. So um, he played calls of a night time, but he never did it for a long time. He'd only do half a dozen. Short bursts. And you get yeah, short bursts, you get a response, then you know the bird's there. I think that's a big thing. That's the only thing I have a problem with. Um, I don't mind anybody, and I've had people in the field with me many times, They'll use a call for a short time. The bird responds, and now it's there. Then I should think it, the art of photography for me is it shouldn't be just going on and on and on and on just to get the perfect shot because it's not the perfect shot if you're stressing the animal so much. So much so that you're drawing the bird off the nest. And while that bird's off the nest, other things are happening. You know, Sometimes I'll desert it. I know for a fact I'll desert it. I had less of sooty owl. I tried it, and she deserted it. Because I tried it every night for half an hour. Boom, she left the nest. That was it. Mm. So... Using the call um, a bit, if you're a twitcher or a birder, to get the bird and see it, that's fine. For taking photographs, I think you should 
You should be mindful of the bird, respectful of the bird. Conservation, if we all, we all talk about conservation, you know. Um, why do we, why, what's the fundamental aim of conservation? Conservation is to protect things as much as we can without totally disturbing them. I particularly don't like handling things. I, I think sometimes the things we do in mist netting can be terrible. You know, a lot of birds die and nobody reports it half the time. You imagine, you imagine us, just think about this in playback term and the mist net size. Imagine someone out there calling John Young all, all day, you know, trying to get me to go out of the house and go and look at it. You just think about it. If I've got a grass wren that lives in here and I'm out there playing the call all day till I go out and the house gets vandal or whatever happens, or I put a big mist net up, imagine us with this massive spider 25 feet wide sitting on a web in a tree with a mist net, a web going across, we run along, we run straight into the web. How do you think you would feel if a giant spider come out with fangs five feet long and drove them into you? Now, when you got hooked up in the web and you knew there was no escape, just think about how a bird feels when they run into a net. And a lot of them die. They just they just can't handle it. Mm. So, and it's it's also, I, I don't know. I, I find it really difficult with, with mist netting. I, I think the waders, I think it's important. Do it not overly. I've got a friend, Cheryl and Arthur Keats, that, probably two of the best waiter people in the country and they're very caring about the birds. I just had them with me in a desert and they saw and heard night parrots um, on, on a trip with me. But they really care about the animal and, and they will are happy to do mist netting enough until we know the birds can be tracked like that Bartel God visited recently, 13,550 kilometres it did in one of flight. That's incredible. We wouldn't have known that without mist netting and catching it up. We don't need to mist net everything. Mm. We need to know where that bird, because if you, if you want to protect Ramstar wetlands, we can't do it. We couldn't have done it unless we knew where the birds were going by misnetting them and tracking them. But, you know, I, I think you do it to a point where you know where they, that habitat is and then you leave them alone. Misnetting in national parks like Iron Range is placed in there. Every time you look at a bird, it's got a band on his leg and it's got a whole heap of them. And then I said to some person once, I said, why are you doing it? He said, we need to know how long it lives. I said, why do we need to know how long it lives? You know it's living there. Every time we go back to find out how it lives, you're going to recatch that bird. That bird's got to go through this all this stress again, just so you can write down and tell me how long it lives. Rubbish. Well, it, it, well, I think it contributes to the knowledge base, though, right? If 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 it's a rare thing, maybe, and it's in small numbers. But why would you want to band? Why would you want to band of white-faced robin six times and catch it three or four times every year when you know the bird's population is stable? I, I mean, the paradise kingfisher, you know, they they, they put. Um, caught those and, and kept going along and, and banned them and they wanted to know if they come back to the same mound every year and I can see the positive action in that because you know you've got to look after the habitat but just to ban common stuff just to go and I've seen people you, when they catch them in a band their, their eyes glow it's like it's like like they've got a fire in their hand or something like that this is so good they hold it up and say look at me I'm holding a yellow-breasted vocal what? I think you're sick doing that if, if you want to go and do it and, and put a band on something to learn about it, to manage the animal. We've got to look at ourselves way beyond how we feel about having the information. Is the information good for the bird? Is it good for looking after the bird? If it is, go for it. If it's just for your own ego, no. I'll get stuck into you every time I see it. Mm. Although, yeah, I, I see that side of it, but also maybe for... It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a contact with nature that's lacking in today's society, right? To, to contact in nature, I can agree with if you do it at a distance. Mm. You can learn a hell of a lot more once you know an animal's there and what you do having to have it in the hand. I'd like to loop back again, apologies, uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the wildlife videography aspect of things. Yeah, yeah. Because I think, so, so, so talk us through how you got into doing that. Like, because, and... and the, the, the progress of technology since you started doing that. You've shown me some photos before about, you know, and you have these huge cameras. So technology's progressed so oh, much. Way far. How, talk us through your wildlife cameraman journey. Well, I mean, when I started, I was followed with Jim Fraser, you know, you know, like I said, he was my mentor. Mike Potts, the dear wolves of the sea, he was another one when we were working on um, Life of Birds. Yeah. Now, I also look, worked on the film, the BBC one, Parrots Look Who's Talking. I've worked with whole heap of things you know? yeah um and what, what what's it like being a wildlife cameraman what's to, what sort of lifestyle it, it's is a it? lon lonely soul lonely if if you got someone with you, you you talk and you don't think and you don't watch i like to concentrate all the time that's why i like my own company um 
it's you become if you've got to have someone with you to do stuff I, I think you're not focusing on the job if you're there to do a job I like if I'm going to do something I like to say I can do it but I, I think when I started off the old thing was um, oh I don't know beta cam there's one before beta cam I can't think of it now I had the old field recorder when I had the, had the button and hit the button on that and I also was a crazy electrician by trade because I made a film called Wings of Silence for Channel 7. All the hours inside the hollow is a whole lot. I worked on it for 10 years. It cost me 300000 on my own money. And, um, but I became a mad electrician, had that power up there and the hides were 100 feet up on Sooty Owl's nest and one of the nests was 102 feet and I was, the hollow was 22 foot deep. So I went down and to do it and picked the babies up and hung them on the wall and I drilled little holes in the wall and put little fibre optic lights so I could... I had a thing coming back to a box of dimmer switches and lights and everything and a monitor so I could watch everything and manage all the light. Um, so it's, it's very technical then. Oh, very. So, yeah. yeah so, 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 and it's so. not... And I think the big thing the BBC taught me, um, and even Jim, a lot of people take a picture. The golden rule is when you're, you're still photographer or you're a filmmaker or a videographer, which I didn't realise for a while, is to... Um, you you got to have... You can't have a the animal right in the middle of the frame, you know, with something looking and nothing behind it. That, that always needs you work the frame in thirds. Your third of the frame comes across, that's where the person is, that's where the bird is, the bird's looking to the right, so there's two thirds of the frame. Right, yeah, yeah, I can see that, yeah. So when you get that, if the bird's looking there, and did he, like when I did the mating of the um, Magnificent Rifle Bird for Pangolin Pictures in America, National Geographic, I worked on that for many, many days. And I shot the whole mating sequence and I didn't realise for a while that the whole thing was happening before sunrise. I, he mated with two females, one after each other in 15 minutes and I just was mind-blowing. It was electrifying, this thing going berserk. And, but once I got that, then I had the shots of him. I followed the whole through and he, he's doing his thing and he's looking up like that. Then for two days I had to go back and film a female coming in so she was looking down so there's eye contact. I, I, I think the interesting thing when, when I was doing that thing and I, I was taught along the way is, you know, it, with the BBC, you you um you don't you don't just go and for me, I like to go and film what the animal does, then write the story later. That's how I think it should be done. But a lot of networks these days say we want the bird looking to the right, we want the bird doing this, we want to doing that. And you're bloody scripted. How am I going to get that? You know, you've got to have a pig parrot looking up to the right. And you've got to spend the whole day just to get that shot. So they've got the other shot coming in. Mm. It's not all it's not all real deal, as as far as I'm concerned. Mm. But for me, you know, I've produced programs, a lot of them, because I had a television program called Wind Years Wild Up with John Young for seven years. And I filmed the behaviour as it was, then we wrote the script afterwards talking about what it did. That's the way I like to do it. I don't like preempting what an animal's going to do. Animals have got their own mind. They'll do things that you can't expect and you can't write something and say, well, I don't want that shot because that's not in the script. Rubbish. You know, film the animal, do its behaviour, do all the right things, and then write the script to suit later. Mm. But when I was doing that, picture because I realised it had to be had to be done right. First thing to do was, okay, we establish a habitat. You have a wide I always do things in threes. Wides, mediums, tight. You know, so I had a whole thing going across the forest with eclectus parrots going across the top. This is the magnum some rifle bird on Cape York. Then a rifle bird called underneath. Then I, I did shots down into the forest with all sorts of mossy stuff. Then I cut him zoomed in tight and then dissolved into him sitting on the perch. Yeah. Displaying on a big log. So you're telling a story with... You tell a story. ...different aspects of... Fir Absolutely. Firstly, uh, you know, uh, quite a low resolution. Absolutely. Which is the habitat and the yeah. landscape, and then you narrow it down. You do. You, you tell a story and you come in, you know, all of a sudden, you know, what's he doing? He's, you know, why is he on this perch? Why is it nice? Because it's a great big wide thing. They like home in spaces. Why do rifle birds display in, in shade? They don't display in the sun. Your sun gets... That's why they have multiple perches. They don't display in the sun. I don't know. They've got all these beautiful colours, but I think it's like budgery goes. The purple comes out in ultraviolet. Mm. And I think there's something about rifle birds we don't know. But I learned after a while when I did the Victoria rifle bird, I got the first mating ever. It was on 60 Minutes one morning. No, Good Morning Australia with Liz Hayes and Steve Lehman. Um, but anyway, I, I did that. And I spent 80 days in the hide trying to get it. 80 days. And I got to the point like I did the, did the night parrot. I'd spent so much time there I couldn't stop and I kept going back and oh blood I'll get up early one morning. I got in and I found all the mating was happening pre sunrise. So I'd been it had been happening every day and I didn't get it. So I got in there when the camera was so grainy that I got it, but when you got it, you know, all that other eighty days of pain, sitting cramped up, no food, hot flies, march flies, fades away. <laughs> yeah. But I think you're telling a story. And that's the thing about still pictures are nice, 
but it's stereo. It's it's um, sits there. It looks nice, beautiful colours. Yeah. Doesn't tell you anything. Beautiful bird, you know. See all the detail. Fine. You get into a picture. I'd rather have a blurry picture, blurry video than I would have it because the animal's doing something. It's mm. talking to you. Mm. And I, I think that's the most important thing when you're working with an animal is to have that contact. I never like a photograph that's looking away from you or filming something looking away from you. It's got to have. It's got to have interaction you've got to have an interaction with the bird and if, if you're a good cameraman you'll be able to bring that out where there is an interaction with the bird where you're talking something if you, you know, sometimes i'll say what are you doing you look and say none of your business you know i'll do that stuff and, and you do those inner reactions and they, even when they, with bow birds in particular you know they, they do all this fancy stuff and and when you, you film the whole display first then you're going back and film the whole display again and, you know satin bear bird might pick up a blue toy after you got the complete thing, he does it. Then you go back and get a close-up shot of him picking up a blue toy. Yeah, and then you can cut from one to the other. That's right. Do you, you do, do you do the post processing as well, or the editing, or do you not? I, well, when I made my seventeen films, I did all the editing myself. I cut it. I yeah, cut yeah, it at yeah. home. But frequently, I sit behind things and do it and, yeah. and look at it. And you know, the worst thing about being a professional filmmaker that you look at something rubbish. That didn't happen at all. You know what? Why did you cut that shot? Why is the bird looking up there? Why is there a space? You know, I, I look at things and I, well, even when I go to movies and things like that, and my wife used to hate it, she said, why can't you appreciate the movie? I said, look, I can appreciate it if it's real, but that's not real, it's just crap, the way it's cut. And you, you, you've got to be your own worst critic. I've got to look at my stuff and say, God, that's bloody awful, I can do better than that. Mm. You should never get in the position and say, that's perfect. You should always look and say, no, I can do it better than that. That animal's got a lot more to tell me than what that's doing. So, mm -hmm. um, well, the, it's it, for me. Like I said, I I, I grew up with those David Attenborough. Um, well, they won't. There'll never be another David Attenborough. Do, do you think? I, I know. I know him in person. I don't care how good you are. You're not going to have that stance. You're not going to have that presence. You know, there's going to be a lot of people that are good, mm. but you know, some people come out of come out of university and they've got a lot of skills, but they don't have the background. He, he's a naturalist. He's just like, just like me. The well, same. It, yeah, well, it goes back to the difference mm. between a birder and a naturalist, yeah. which I still don't get, you know, I don't have a handle on what you think is a difference. Well, you know, if, I think if, if, if you're a birder, that, that's your main focus. But it's not my main focus. I look at the thing, I look at the plant, I look where the tree is. Mm. I, I look at animal behavior. I call myself an animal behaviorist. That's what I do. Mm. A, a birder's... Look, sure, people call you know. How many birds have you seen? Oh, I said, oh, I don't know, but I've found a lot of nests. I don't know. Do you use eBird? Sorry? Do you no, use I don't use any. I don't use, use any, any eBirds. Okay. Simply because one, my letter and kite column was put on there last year and it was disclosed, and the birds were rushed until they were deserted. The whole colony went, which annoyed me immensely. But no, I don't. I don't use any of that. that. And why would you say you don't? Is it because you you prefer to, you know, stay clear from the technology side or? I, I, I don't, I have a Facebook page, everything I do on that, I'm very careful about what I put on there. I'm not negative towards anybody, I tell a story on there. And I think, you know, it's got a big following now. And um, I had a bigger following last year, but there was a bit of negativity, so I took that sold off and started a new one. I think there's about 500 on there now, or something like that. But I, I tell a story, and, and what I put out there is animal behaviour, and where they live, and what they do. And it, if, if I'm going to show something, it's not about actually taking the field out and giving someone a location. I show them the habitat where they can start looking. And I think that's got way more benefit than what it is taking them to one spot where there's so much concentration. Now, there's been stories overseas where birds have been actually squashed to death. So many birders come to look at them, mm. you know, with um, the where they've been going to the one spot that the birds have just been raft. So, um, being a birder, that's good, and I applaud people for doing it. If that's what they get their enjoyment out of and they like being that, well, good on them. But surely there is some considerable overlap, you know, because, oh, there is. yeah, and, Absolutely. and and for me, I'm, I'm realizing that because I, I always find myself looking at everything when I'm out birding, like birding is my focus. That's, that's, that's becoming a naturalist, what that's doing. Right. You know, you're a birder, but often when you go to the bird and you've seen, seen a lot of birds, you'll start looking at other things. I mean, I've got a lot of friends on Facebook now that are into birds so much, but now they're looking at frogs and all of a sudden they're looking at blue crayfish and they're looking at all this stuff. <coughs> I had a student... Um, called Melissa Whitby. She's now a ranger at Springbrook in, in uh, Queensland, uh, in the National Parks. And she's probably one of the most skilled female bird people that I know. She's obsessed. It's not just... She goes out not just to look up. She loves taking photos, but she doesn't care if it's a bloody, uh, you know, a dead photo or whatever it looks like. She just loves watching and sharing the space. She always sits back. And I taught her to do it. And 
I opened the door for her, but she's going to be one of the most skilled naturalists this country has ever seen. She's, she, you know, she was just, she went to a place yesterday and found painted honey in his nesting and, you know, plummeted finches nesting and all that sort of stuff. And she took, rang me up and I just talked her way through it. And she did what I asked her to do and she's done it. But the fact of the matter is, when I found this quail shush on the wall, on the Athen Tablelands, I'd been looking for that for 10 years. And hearing, unfortunately, driving machines and that sort of stuff, I've lost a lot of my high pitch hearing. So, oh. and we all do when we get older. And her hearing is so sensitive. She's just in her forties. Well, that's a big, big side of birding, isn't it? It and is. You haven't got hearing a lot of trouble, and because I've done so much with birds, and I know where to expect it, I get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I do. But she was sitting in the car. We're listening to this thing. It was really interesting that we're driving on the road. I think it was in two eighteen. I think somewhere. Anyway, this particular day, and um, it was raining heavy. I was in the Toyota, and she actually heard this bloody quail thrush call out the window, and she said, "I think I heard a quail thrush." I said, "Are you serious? There's engine noise." And her hearing is so sensitive. Mm. And she said, can we back up? And <coughs> she got out of the car and said, there it is, I can hear it calling. And I couldn't hear it. Mm. That was down the hill a bit. And she walked around and I saw my first one. Right. And then next year we had more. And then I found a nest with chicks. And I found another nest with chicks. And it grew. And, you know, we're out of pair. And I got these pictures up on the wall. And now it's from the person. Well, it's all part of the, of the, of the skill set you need for, for birding. And, and, and being a naturalist, um, you know, more generally. And I've, I'm interested also in the you know the personal side of why we're into nature and how it helps us in our personal life yeah how how has your love for nature um and your searching for knowledge helped you in your personal life i guess been detrimental sometimes uh, well we could talk <laughs> I, about I that mean, i mean the fact of the matter is you know it it's um you become so obsessed that sometimes you can't see it and i'm one of those people who say you can't do it i'm gonna do it and it hasn't helped my marriage in, in, in a few cases, many cases actually. One to where one collapsed, that was just the way it was. Um, but it also, I think, as, as I get older, I mean, fact of the matter is, now I'm on a health kick at the moment. I've, I've lost six kilos in the last few days. I've cut all, cut all bread out, all dairy products, no, no red meat, just, just fish, rice. Terrible, eating rice every day. Oh. <laughs> but my weight's gone right down. I can put jeans on that I haven't worn for six years. But... Um, it's personal esteem now that I've done all this sort of stuff. And January, I'm going to be 70 years of age. 29th of January, I'll be 70 years of age. I mean, I'm still fairly fit. I can do a lot of stuff that most people can't. And I want to keep doing it. And the birding and that sort of stuff. Birding, call it birding. Oh, maybe I'm a birder. <laughs> <laughs> but birding and the natural history has kept me going because I need to be fit to go and do this stuff. That's right. So without having that natural history background and the need to go and do it, I'd probably sit in the chair here and, you know, do nothing. Mm. But I know if I'm not fit, I'm not going to be able to do it. I want to keep doing it until I can't stand up. I want to lay on the bed on, on my last day and think, God, just imagine that. Imagine, remember that day of the night, Pat? It was incredible. Mm -hmm. That's how I want to think. Mm -hmm. I eat, drink and sleep it. And you know, the, the work that I've done over the years, rightly or wrongly, it, it's been done with conservation like Tidal Wetlands, you know. It happened because of my conservation interest. And, mm. and if people are going to be negative towards you, you've got to put that away. You've got to put that away because negativity eats you alive. And I know that from personal experience. So you put that negative away and put positive energy into things. You know. Yes. It's like you know, you know, when, when in martial arts you can do amazing things with, with full power, and you can do it twice as much if you put your energy and your thought mm. into it. You know. But if if you don't practice that stuff and keep it up, like I have done with birding so long. Yeah. And now it's not just a matter of finding stuff. Now I can go along and I can teach others. Mm. And what I do on my Facebook page, that's going to be my biggest outlet for conservation along the way. I have a lot of people in government that ring me up privately and ask for their private advice. They'll ask me for what to do or I look at reports and, and I do that stuff. But I, I'm not out there to big note myself, not at all. And do I'm you think the, the obsession that that necessitates, right, the, the, the obsession that you're talking about earlier, do you think you can, you know, because obsession isn't by nature a positive thing? Mm. No. Do you agree? I agree. So... Yeah. How do you regulate the obsession? I, I, I think the older I get, you realise that the obsession's good. I mean, people ask you these days, when do you go birding? I said, I don't go birding much these days. Much I don't. Because, because I've done a lot of stuff. I'm going to do something. I'll focus on something. Might be the buff button quail. Might be the new honey eater that I've found. All that stuff. I, I focus on that stuff and put my energies into that. Um, but I also like to come home and have that time where I don't have to answer to anyone. Look, I've lived by myself here for eight years. I've got a sunbird building a nest out there. 
I mean, how good is that? I mean, what's the biology of that burn that's happening? I put a bit of rope up there two years and the buggers went like that for two years. Last week, they're into it. Yeah. I mean, I sit down and look at it and I know what they're going to do. And you know, the mail's on the window there right now. Lovely. Um, but, th- but there you go, you know, you've got lots of different... Um, so, so do, you have, do, you, do you have a local patch where you just go out birding close no, to here? No. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you're not a patch birder? or No, no, I, I don't. I, I go focus for something. You know, with, with my insect stuff and moths and that, I'll have particular areas, but I never go in a public area. I always go right out of the way. Yeah. And the more, like when I was looking for the night parrot, the more remote I thought, the more chances I'm going to come across something else, and I have a few times. Well, it makes sense, yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. And, and the isolation, I can go and camp in a rainforest, I do whatever I like by myself for weeks, it makes no difference at all. I come, come back at the night time and I hop in my mozzie dome, you've got photographs of that, and I think, God, this is good, look at this. I'm laying here, there's a sooty owl calling over there, you know, Rufus Owls, the yellow belly gliders like in the of Mount Speck of a night time, frogs, you know, you know, have a scorpion going up over the tent of a night time, centipedes, all that stuff. It's all interactive and sitting there of a night time even watching all the insects coming into a mercury vapor light, all the new stuff that comes out of the forest and you know, you look at all this stuff and say, We don't see this during the day. You know, you can walk around you won't see it, but if you put a light trap up, which I do a lot now, all these amazing beetles, all these moths and like the Hercules moths, cops and opera Hercules. The biggest moth in the world. One night I had 65 of them come into a shoot on a really wet night. They were hanging over each other. It was just an out-of-body experience. Well, it goes, yeah, that's, that's, that's right. And, and you... I, I think the other thing, Thomas, too, the more I do, the more I realise how insignificant my knowledge is. I am an absolute babe in the woods. That's the way I see myself. Every time I go into the field, I learn something. And I think you never get to a point where you think you know everything. Nobody knows everything about anything. And everybody says you're an expert. I said, no. The word expert's a drip under pressure, that's what that is. That's what expert means to me. There's always learning, right? Learning, you've got to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Let's um, move on to the to the closing questions. It's been a great discussion and thank you again for, for your time. My absolute pleasure. Um, so, <laughs> what's your favourite bird? Look, for many years it was a Rufus Owl. I used to have this owl called Dirty Harry. <laughs> you know, I spent, I looked for him and I found the first nest and eggs in 1976. I think the original one was found in 11th September 1916 by Harry Barnard at Meunga Creek near Cardwell. I still remember reading everything. It was 72 feet, you saw the owl, flushed it. He was a collector in the old days, like Sid Jackson and Rufus Scrubbird. I think, I think out of the uh, favourite ones, the Rufus Scrubbird is really interesting. You know, I've, there's only been probably four of us, five of us in the world that's ever found a nest. I've found a few. Merv Goddard was another one. Merv Goddard was my mentor that taught me so much, you know. He was a collector in the early days. He also pretty well pioneered the roof of scrub. But the original guy was Sid Jackson. Back in the early days, we talk about the collector days. We didn't know nothing about scrub birds without Sid Jackson and you know, AJ North and Campbell and all that stuff doing it. Merv Goddard was like that. He, he, was, he was like me, he just obsessed. But he went to a different different level to me. But um, Rufus Owl, favourite bird. R- Rufus Owl, favourite bird. Now the red goshawk up on the wall there. You've got a photograph of that. Oh, I'd love to, I'd love to see one. Oh, yeah. well. They're incredible. Um, it, it's interesting. I think they're in a lot of trouble. I'm not sure why it is, but at least 30 to 40% of the nests are taken over by whistling kites, even though they build, beat the hell out of whistling kites. I used to have 62 breeding sites. I think at the moment I might have 11 or 12. That's in the last few years. So we've got to be really careful what we do there. That's right. When it goes, goes back to the... Conf- um, the con- night, con- night parrot. Why wouldn't it? But it's not my favourite. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's something. <laughs> look, my, look, I, I dream about finding a paradise parrot. Have I put some effort in the last few years? Oh, yeah. What's that? The paradise parrot? Paradise parrot. I don't believe it exists. But like I said, four years ago, I found this place. And when I had my television program, which was about 12 years ago, 15 years ago now, I did a story on Golden Shoulder Parrots one night. And this guy rang me up and down south in an area where probably not too far out of their range. And, and he said, we've got a parrot here like that, but it drills a hole in termite mound. He said, these have got red shoulders. You know, why would this guy say something? And I said, what sort of mound is it? I know these big pudding mounds and it's half dead. So I said, geez, I've got to go and have a look. And I did, was th- did you go and have a look? I did. <laughs> and <laughs> nothing, right? No. No, look, I got to the point, I found holes in the mounds and kingfishers, redback kingfishers drill holes in termite mounds as well in a whole range of different termite mounds if they haven't got a creek bank or something like that because they do in creek banks mostly. But red, all kingfishers drill holes straight in, uh, in into the mound, and the mounds are pretty well got to have termites in them because kingfishers don't always sit on the eggs. The incubation thing is heat comes from termites, so they don't have to sit on the eggs all the time. But the kingfishers drill holes straight in. 
and they've got a chamber at the end where the birds, it's dug low enough so the bird can sit in it and look out. These weren't like that, they went down on an angle. Hmm. And they went to a big spaceship cabin into a carton material of the termite mound. Stupidly, there's eggshell in the mound and I didn't collect it at the time, there's a little bit of eggshell. And I, I would have known for sure, but I still remember the thing that was about 11 inches across and about 15 inches wide is this chamber. But it went down into this chamber and I found three of them one morning. One of them was fairly, I would have thought of 12 months old. And I've been back there so many times and never seen anything. I mean, these things could be like night parrot. They could be here, they could be moved somewhere else, who knows? But they could also not, they could also be extinct, which oh, they absolutely. probably are, right? I, I think most likely. Yeah, yeah. I, I so think, you've got to get to that point where you're, where, where you have to stop being no, optimistic. Can't do that. Can't do that. If I'd have stopped being the optimistic with a night parrot, I'd have given it away and we'd have probably still not known. Hmm. There was a lot of people out there saying, well, it's extinct, it's not going, you know. They're, they're not going to find them. And then there was evidence turned up. Shorty Kip, when I, when I heard about, I mean, Walter Bowles, I know Walter, um, you know, when he picked up the one on the road north of Bullia. Um, that was on a property um, that I went on to and I was on that for five years looking for them and never found a thing. But I still kept going. So, um, what would you say, what, what would you say is your dream bird? Oh, look, I, it, it's hard to say. Um, I think my dream was finding the night parrot when I found it. And, you know, I've I've been there and done that, you know, and I have I think probably the biggest thing was the honey that I've recently found, which will come out in due course. I'm actually writing a book on nesting eggs at the moment and the complete biology. The only thing I'll be using of anybody else is the um, distribution map by Graham Pizzi, who was a friend of mine. He actually credited me in his book, so I'll be doing that. But I'd heard a call, you know, many years ago, 12 years ago, when I was, I was well, a bit more before I was looking for the night parrot and in this remote area and... And I was here in June and thinking, you know, what am I going to do next? And I, I remembered this thing. I thought, God, I've never ever found out what was doing that call. And I went back and, and saw the owner. And I wasn't allowed onto the property, so I spoke spoke to um, uh, a mayor, because I used to be the guest speaker for the local government for the Queensland state. And um, he said, I'll get you on. But he said, you just have to make sure you keep it to yourself. And so I went back and threw him and said, look, this particular mayor said, you're welcome. He said, but just keep it to yourself and just don't take anybody in there. So I did. And I went in there about 25 k's, drove and bashed my way through the bush and got into this valley. And I heard you think, holy shit, I've heard that thing before. And it's still here. And the first afternoon I saw it, and I couldn't believe my eyes what it looked like. And uh, I know the genus it's in. And two days later, I got 11 pairs. I picked them all out. And I didn't expect them to be nesting, but they were. Then I ended up finding seven nests over two days. It's been on my Facebook page as Nest and Eggs Shown. And in due course, it's going to be on the front cover of the book. And... Tell me a little bit more about the book. When is that coming out? It's probably going to take a couple of years. I'm not going to rush into it. I want to do it right. I'd thought about doing a whole thing on nests and eggs. You know, instead of me taking everything to the grave with, I need to put something out there. And between that and my Facebook page is going to be my way of giving things out. And if people want to spend the time and the finances to do it, I'm happy to take them. I'm happy to take one, two. I prefer to just take one person or just a couple. It becomes more private. Group become competitive and it's too hard. And what, <coughs> what would you say is your... If if you had two weeks, um, and you could go anywhere, <laughs> where would you go? Back to my new night parrot site, the birds where I found last year that um, this stockman. I think I may have told you the story. Stockman told about his um, told the owner of the property that he, he thought he'd flush on a John Young's birds. Finally, got the stockman to ring me and I spoke to him, and I asked him where it was, and he told me, and I said whereabouts. He said, oh, along this hundred k. Some of the Jesus, that's a big area. But so where is that exactly? Let's just say in the Simpson Desert, leave it at that. <laughs> but I went went there and I came out of this rise and I came onto this particular bit and, oh, jeez, I thought there's a night parrot here, this is going to be it, and sat there in dusk. And, and the uh, ding was, the amazing thing was, this one, the other one's got ding, ding, and that also had dee, da, ding. This one, dee, da, ka, ching. And I heard the call, but it had, had the, it had the qualities of it, and I thought, God, you know, that, that's a night parrot, no doubt about it, and that's, you know, it's a, it's a big area, and I've already got 10 pairs there. And I haven't been able to get back, but and have you been able to share that information with um, no. other people so that you could so you so you can know so we can collectively work to protect it? No, no, that'll that'll stay. At, at the moment, it's look. I, I'm also well and truly aware that there's you know there's there's a lot of mischievous stuff goes on with with, with parrots in particular. Um, but there's also the other thing is too with parrot breeding. I've a lot of a lot of friends that breed parrots. Without them, look at the orange belly parrot. If we didn't have breeding programs, we wouldn't have them. And maybe that'll happen down the night parrot down the track. But first and foremost, I'm going to be completely greedy, over the top, 
I want John Young to find out about this. That's what's going to happen this time. And I'm going to film the biology of this thing because when I was there and I saw one one night, I had my stretcher because if you're going to find these things, I went out and laid my uh, mattress on the ground and slept in amongst it close enough to where I could hear the birds so I didn't disturb them during the daytime. And I was laying there in the middle of the night and, and I heard this thing coming. I thought, what the hell is that? And the, because I've had some big mulga snakes come to my bed in the night time and that's a bit scary. <laughs> but anyway, I laid there and I could hear this kind of thing, surely not. And, and I, it came to probably hear to the television, you know, maybe a couple of metres and I slowly lifted the light up and here it is, he's standing there. And the yellow to me, it seemed, I may be wrong, but the yellows didn't seem to be quite so low. He's leaning over. It might have been my vivid imagination, but the yellow seemed way more up the chip. And um, anyway, the next day, uh, I camped there again, and I actually heard him coming in. He was feeding it twice a night on dusk, and then again at daylight. And they didn't seem though inside the big rings, just like the ones at um, ones at um, Brighton Downs. But I think this bird's got more yellow on it. It's got a very distinct call. Do you um, ever think you get ahead of yourself? How do you mean? Um, I don't know, like the excitement of the moment and the excitement of the memory. Do you think it can lead to conclusions that aren't no. necessarily correct? No, I don't. I, I, I question myself all the time. All the time. I go yeah. away and say, did I see that or not? Mm. And I analyse things. When, when I couldn't find an iPad, I, I used to go away and, and uh, keep, keep meticulous notes and go over it and in my mind say, okay, that didn't work. Why didn't it work? You know? Maybe there's some other aspect I haven't seen. Maybe I should be sitting in Cliffside tomorrow night. I'd go and focus on that, not not in as you had every time. But when that didn't work, I'd come back and go home to spawn it again. I thought, no, there's something I'm something I'm missing and something I'm overlooking, and, and that's what I do. So you're trying different ways to get Absolutely. to the same to the same thing. Yes, you, look. The fact of the matter is, Thomas, you've asked me. You know, are you overconfident? Sometimes maybe I am overconfident. I think, but that's got me in a lot of places. But um. I make mistakes like everybody else does. Anyone who says they don't make a mistake is a complete liar and out of this world. They just are. But you've got to analyse it. You've got to analyse and things. And if if um, if I go and look at something and I, I go home and I, I might go home with a, which is what you said, I might go home with a preconceived idea and but maybe they're all all in this stuff. Maybe they're all in this. Now I know for packing our night parents don't just nest in spinner bricks. I found them in Portulaca. In a dense patch of Portulaca, and the only reason that was probably because the great season might have been one parent a thousand does that. I don't know. But never ever consume, never ever assume that a barn owl always nests in a hollow tree because they'll nest in rabbit burrows, they'll nest, nest in a hole in, a, in an eagle's nest or something like that. I mean, pink cockatoos, they normally nest in, not nest in, in hollow trees, but sometimes they'll chew a hole in the side of a wedge tailed eagle's nest, they'll drill in it. Little corellas will nest in, in holes in trees, but they'll also dig a hole in a, in a vertical bank like they do around Lake Eyre or nest in a you know, where the banks went away and there's been rabbit burrows and going rabbit burrows. Right. They do. So it's it's so multifaceted and endless. It's an endless journey yeah. that a naturalist has, isn't it? N- never, never assume anything. Never assume that you've seen a bird a dozen times. Years are certainly in type of place that they'll all do it because there's always an exception to the rule. Field guides. I keep on telling someone. And they'll say, "Oh, the field guide says they're not there." No, the field guide tells you where people have actually seen them and recorded them. They don't tell you where the bird is. Birds have got wings; they move. So you know, it's like a night parrot. Like I said. Nick Leesenberg, who I highly respect, has done more than I've than anybody alive, but I'll bet he'll be the first one to admit you. I don't know all about this bird. I'm, I'm skewing the surface. I know what I've learnt. You know, but God knows what else they do, or where else they're going to turn up. So. That's right. Well, it's a fa- fabulous place to end, John, and thanks again for My inviting problem. me in your home to record this. And, um, well, all the best to you. It's an absolute honour. Thank you. Thank you, John. My pleasure. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to or watching this episode of the Birding Today podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about the show, you can follow me on all my social media platforms. The links are in the description and in the show notes. Um, And if you want to take it a step further, you can also support me on Patreon as well. Thank you, happy birding, and I'll catch you in the next episode.